All right. Well, thank you. Um, my name is Sean Auckland. I'm with Spear, and you're joining us for a City Efficiency Leadership Council um, webinar. Today's webinar is identifying energy burdens and improving energy equity. Our presenters are from the Texas Energy Poverty Research Institute, and they conduct research, develop tools, pilot projects to advance reliable, affordable, and clean energy. And today they're gonna to be really focusing on showcasing a tool that they've created. And I'm gonna let them take a deeper dive into that. But before we get started, I have a few items I'd like to cover. So those of you who are joining us and are not familiar with SPEAR, SPEAR, we are a regional energy efficiency organization, one of six across the nation. Um, we work with the Department of Energy. We also work with state energy conservation offices. SPEAR, our, um, our nonprofit covers Texas and Oklahoma. Our work is an expansive policy, building codes, high performance buildings, and the program that I manage is a local government program. And we are a membership organization. Uh, and so as you can see in that list, our membership is a pretty wide um, bandwidth of anyone who's interested in accelerating the adoption of energy efficient products and services in South Central United States. A little bit about um, this webinar and the support. Uh, we are supported by the State Energy Conservation Office and mainly to push forward the City Efficiency Leadership Council. And that is this webinar is part of the umbrella programming that we do through the City Efficiency Leadership Council. I um, put together webinars. We also have newsletters. and our newsletters, we cover grants, events, and member highlights, specifically with a local government in mind. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member of the City Efficiency Leadership Council, you're welcome to check out our website at eepartnership.org. Cities in the name, but we cover school districts, universities, counties, um, as well as state agencies. And, and please check out our events calendar for, um, we have several webinars going on this summer and at uh, different events. One specifically is that this summer we are having hosting a statewide focus group. Uh, the term focus group in this situation is really, it's a meeting of, of about an hour and a half of community engagement and really hearing what local governments, again, cities, counties, higher education, council of governments, including nonprofits, community-based nonprofits, and having a discussion from uh, what our findings were in a statewide survey that we're performing. So um, again, if you scan that QR code, you can take that survey if you're a local government that's under this umbrella that's eligible. We also have an annual industry and policy workshop coming up in September, and uh, we would love for you to attend. Um, check it out. Again, there's a QR code. You can scan that and find out more information or go to our website. And at that uh, workshop, we will be presenting the final results from our survey. And that survey is encompassing air quality, uh, electrification, resiliency, energy efficiency, uh, as well as energy equity. A little bit on housekeeping. Um, so today, if you could please put your questions in the chat, and that is located at the bottom of the screen, um, you will see Q&A. If there's a question that I can answer, I will, um, but our presenters will be busy presenting. So we're going to hold those questions and I'll help assist with moderating until the end of their presentation. All presentations will be posted on our website. Also, we have a YouTube channel over um, with over a hundred different videos and resources and they will be posted on our YouTube channel. And then we can also receive CEUs for attending this webinar. But if you are interested in receiving CEUs, please respond and submit a survey. And the survey uh, link will be provided in the chat um, as well in a follow-up email. Okay, without further ado, uh, today our speakers will um, demonstrate the use of the Energy Equity Inspector. It's a geospatial tool developed by TEPRI in collaboration with the Southeast Energy Efficiency Alliance, one of the other RIOs, regional energy efficiency organizations we work with in the nation. 
they'll be again talking about a deeper dive, but I wanted to introduce uh, Boba Chi. She is the director of research at Texas at Tepri and a doctor can of room and can you make sure that I'm saying your last name correctly? Yeah, that was fine. Um, okay. yeah, and, you, and from her bio, she is a people-centered researcher working on the nexus of climate and energy on a range of topics, specifically energy and climate equity, indoor health, well-being, climate risks, and flooding and heat stress resilience. And she has over eight years professional research experience in sustainability management, energy equity, climate resilience, and construction management. Um, and then our, our other speaker is Andrew Robinson. He's a research analyst, al analyst and program manager at TEPRI, and his work focuses primarily on helping to execute TEPRI's mission-driven research agenda to meet its strategic goals through community outreach, research initiatives, and the development of pilot projects and tools. Prior to joining TEPRI, Andrew worked for the Texas Senate Research Center during the 87th Texas Legislative Session, and he received his master's in global policy studies from LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. And again, um, this is a very short introduction. I, they have so much experience and I, you know, with a, the short amount of time, this doesn't quite do them justice. And I'm so happy that you all are taking time uh, to present to us today. So I'm gonna stop sharing and let you all screen share. Alrighty, uh, thank you, Sean. And I just wanted to thank you and the SPEAR team for having us here today. Uh, again, my name is Andrew Robison and I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Bobachi Kanapuram. Um, and we're gonna be talking today about a few things that TEPRI is currently um, you know, offering and working on um, with respect to energy equity in Texas. Um, so I just wanted to first reintroduce ourselves. Um, I think Sean did a good job of kind of giving an idea of who we are, but we're the Texas Energy Poverty Research Institute and our mission focuses on advancing equitable solutions for affordable, reliable, and clean energy so all people can thrive. And we define that as being um, you know, affordable in the sense of decreasing energy burdens for low to moderate income households, uh, reliability being that um, there's energy resilience to address energy access and respond to energy outages, as well as clean. And in that sense, we refer to clean being um, ensuring that uh, clean energy has parity across the board with other um, energy generation technologies. Um, and the way we, we sort of execute our mission is through a number of areas. So uh, first we focus on developing um, you know, unique research products such as uh, what we'll present on a little bit later, as well as um, tools focused at policymakers and individuals to better understand the energy landscape in Texas. Um, we also work on building networks where networks currently don't exist. You know, sometimes the energy world can be a little bit siloed um, with different stakeholders, and we, we try and break down those barriers and ensure that everyone's uh, talking to each other on the topic of energy equity and energy poverty. Um, and then lastly, we also focus on piloting uh, different energy models that may or may not exist currently. Um, just for instance, right now, we're working on the development of a virtual power plant at an affordable housing uh, community down in uh, the Galveston area and Houston area. Um, and we're also in the process of developing um, a solar option for affordable housing um, in the Rio Grande Valley as well um, to sort of expand access to clean technologies to communities who may not otherwise have access right now. Um, and so just to kind of give you an idea of everything we're going to cover today. Um, so I wanted to first sort of focus on describing what the energy equity inspector is, sort of how it came about. Um, and then I'll take a little bit of a deep dive into everything it offers in terms of uh, information for policymakers and researchers, or really just anyone who's kind of interested in um, energy equity uh, data and indicators in Texas. Um, and then Bobachi will take a little bit of time to go over her Community Voices and Energy Survey Initiative. That's a statewide research effort to better understand um, people and their relationship to energy in Texas. Um, and then um, kind of to wrap things up, we'll, we'll sort of bring everything together and kind of connect the dots on how um, these two offerings can help you all um, in what you do and um, see how Tepri can play a better role in assisting the work that you currently do. Um, but just to kind of get started, I want to, to start off by, you know, just going over what, how we define energy equity as an organization and how it has guided the work that we do. 
Um, so we, as an organization, define energy equity as the process of allocating resources and opportunities as needed to create affordable, accessible, and sustainable, excuse me, sustainable and resilient energy outcomes for all households. Um, and the importance of defining this is, um, you know, seen in, in the work that we do because we kind of need to be clear about the thresholds of how uh, we measure the success of our work. Um, we, as an organization, believe that affordable energy means that energy costs are less than 6% of household income. That's sort of the industry standard with respect to energy costs across academia and across governments in, in the states. Um, accessible, meaning that there's you know ready access and affordable access to energy services um, in your area. Um, sustainable means that the energy being used benefits or at least minimizes harm to people, planet, and prosperity. And then the resilient aspect of this definition means that energy services are designed to withstand disruptions and recover quickly from outages so that people have, uh, you know, energy when they need it the absolute most. Um, and so the energy equity inspector um, tool, as Sean mentioned, was something that we co-developed with the Southeast Energy Efficiency Alliance a little while back. And there... Um, Spears, like sister organization for uh, the Southeast covering, I believe, 11 states. Um, and we developed this tool to kind of better understand uh, the different relationships of equity indicators in energy across populations in the Southeast. And the tool utilizes a number of different publicly available data sets to help measure um, both the combination of energy and environmental challenges that face different community communities across the region. Um, and, and it kind of gives um, the users uh, a clear insight into different things like energy costs, greenhouse gas emissions, um, housing quality, um, you know, racial demographics, um, energy burdens, energy affordability gaps, and things like that that I'll go into depth a little bit more down the road. Um, and then again, it, it covers uh, the 11 southeastern states that SIA um, has jurisdiction over, and then Texas um, from the Tepri perspective. Um, with some of the data sets being at the county level and some of the data sets being down to the census tract level. Um, and we get all this data from publicly available sources. So this is things like uh, DOE, um, EPA, the Census Bureau, and then uh, the lead tool in particular is really helpful for us to understand energy affordability data for the, the communities that we're um, most interested in. Um, and then as we're sort of like looking at the tool in a second, I wanted to just give you all a brief overview of some of the, the key definitions here that will um, guide the, the overview of the tool and everything it has to offer. So when I refer to LMI, I'm really referring to low and moderate income households that is referring to those who are between zero and 80% of area median income. And so in this case, if I'm talking about a county, I'm referring to the county's area median income. Um, energy burden just represents the percentage of household income that's allocated to energy costs. And so, as I mentioned earlier, earlier we define affordable energy as being 6% or less um, of household income. And then for those um, who are 6% or more, we define that as unaffordable. And for those 10% or more, we define that as having an extreme energy burden. Um, and then the energy affordability gap is, is basically the difference between what people currently pay in energy and what they would pay if they were at the 6% threshold of their income. So that's like if they say if 6% of their income is $600 and they currently pay 1000 the difference would be 400 and that's the energy affordability gap. Um, and the EJ screen vulnerability index percentile is actually something created by the EPA. Um, and this is an index value that shows the relative risk of vulnerability to environmental hazards, um, combining environmental risk and the presence of low income and BIPOC communities to kind of uh, make it a more equitable representation of different environmental threats. Um, and then BIPOC communities just is an acronym for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, um, if that wasn't already known. So just sort of thinking about how the energy equity inspector can help, um, we designed this to sort of be a tool for uh, different uses um, across the board, but we um, it, its main focus is really to help folks better understand different demographic, environmental, and energy indicators within a given service area. 
So this might be a county, this might be a portion of a city, this might be a, a region or even a, a state as a whole, um, just to kind of give people a, a more clear data-driven idea of um, what the energy, the key energy indicators in their area actually are. Um, and it helps to identify any disparities across income, racial, and geographic lines in particular. So the differences between uh, energy costs and energy burdens in different regions um, and, and across demographic uh, indicators as well. And then it, we sort of designed it to help with grant applications and organizational publications. So if you're in the process of applying for one of the federal grants from the IRA, for instance, uh, you could back it up with some of the data from this energy equity inspector. Um, and then also, if you're kind of coming from the position of I have resources and I'm looking to best allocate them where I can, this sort of helps you guide your decision making in that process as well. Um, so just to kind of dive in a little bit, I wanted to, to point out, pull out a few of the key energy equity indicators in some of the biggest geographies in the state, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of all the different data that the, the tool can provide. Um, so these are six of the most populous counties in Texas. They are not the six most populous because a number of them were in the greater Dallas area. And I wanted to make sure we had a little bit of uh, geographical diversity here um, just to kind of go over it. But um, on this slide, we have three key indicators that the, I pulled from the Energy Equity Inspector to kind of compare across um, some of the largest counties here in Texas. The first being the average energy burden for households between 80 and, excuse me, zero and 80% of area median income for that relative county. Um, the second being the average en energy affordability gap for those households. So of those households, what is the average overpayment of energy they're paying beyond the affordability threshold in a given year, in a given month? And then just the flat number of households with high or extreme energy burden. So in this case, this is anyone above that 6% energy affordability threshold. And so just kind of looking at these different uh, geographies, we can pull out kind of a few interesting stories. So um, just for context, um, for all households in Texas, the average energy burden percentage is somewhere between like three and 4%. And for those zero to 80% of area median income, it's somewhere around 8%. So um, for Harris, Dallas, Tarrant and Bear counties, um, they're all kind of within that average threshold um, for energy affordability in low-income households. Um, but Travis and Hidalgo counties kind of paint a more interesting picture of um, how energy can be differently affordable depending on um, the relative uh, you know, intensity of uh, median incomes in different areas. So I think as uh, we all know, the, the cost of living in Travis County is pretty high. And as such, the uh, area median income is somewhat higher here as well. So I believe it's somewhere around 70 something thousand for a one, uh, you know, for 100 percent of the area median income for a one person household. Um, so even though the relative energy burden is lower, it doesn't mean the absolute um, energy affordability is is necessarily less um, be, just because it's a a smaller percentage of that income because of the fact that the area median income here is a little bit higher. Whereas in Hidalgo County, um, down in South Texas, the area median income is somewhat lower. So it's a lot easier for um, the energy cost to represent a bigger portion of, of their income in that area. Um, but across the board, we can we can kind of think about this in, in real context as well. You know, if I'm a lower income household and I'm struggling to make ends meet, an extra 30, 40, 50 dollars a month for energy is really going to make or break uh, the bank. And it sort of just paints a broader picture of the level of energy unaffordability in some parts of the state um, for low income households. And then sort of connecting it back to some of those equity indicators, I pulled here uh, the annual electricity related greenhouse gas emissions for each of these counties, as well as the relative uh, racial demographic percentages, so percentage BIPOC population for each county, as well as the EJ screen vulnerability index percentage. And I won't necessarily go over all of these um, in depth, but if you kind of notice Hidalgo County in particular, um, it has both a high percentage BIPOC population as well as one of the highest EJ screen vulnerability index percentages in the state. So that basically paints a picture of, you know, this is a um, historically underserved county in terms of the demographics of the population in combination with other environmental risks that sort of combine with that um, higher 
energy relative energy burden percentage for the entire uh, low and moderate income population in the county. So as a state uh, policymaker, for instance, that might Hidalgo County and its uh, surrounding counties might be um, an interesting example for me to focus some of my energy um, to under, under, better understand what's driving those high energy burdens and what's driving those high environmental risk factors in the region. Um, and this is some of the visual representation that the energy equity inspector can provide. So this is the average energy affordability uh, gap per low to moderate income household. So this is for all the households in the state between zero and 80% of area median income. What's the average energy affordability gap sort of ranging from the lowest end of you know, $200 per year more than they should be paying to up to $2,200 per year more than they should be paying. So um, if we, it kind of helps us to understand which parts of the state are people struggling the most. And as we can see this, um, there's a higher concentration kind of in the central part of the state. So um, I don't remember exactly which counties those are off the top of my head um, that are in the, the deep, deep purple, but it, it kind of point goes to show, you know, what is the which which communities are struggling the most with, um, you know, paying such a large percent of their income towards uh, electricity costs in the area. And then from here, we can actually um, see a relative correlation between those with the highest energy affordability gaps and those with the highest greenhouse gas emissions per household. So that's what this this uh, particular map is showing. What are the average greenhouse gas emissions um, from electricity? per low to moderate income household. So as we can see, um, kind of in this central part of the central south part of the state here, there's both high uh, average greenhouse gas emissions per low to moderate income household and high energy affordability gap. So it sort of shows um, the loose relationship between um, high energy costs and high greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, that's also a useful tool for connecting the value of energy efficiency interventions in low income communities to show the value of how energy efficiency and energy uh, saving measures can both benefit um, from an economic perspective and from an environmental perspective. Um, and then from here, as I mentioned, this is the EJ screen vulnerability index percentile. So this is that EPA index uh, that combines environmental risk factors and um, you know, indicators about racial demographics and low income demographics. So um, the highest um, environmental risk combined with low income and in, uh, BIPOC communities is concentrated along uh, the border, particularly in the Rio Grande Valley and also in kind of the areas around El Paso. Um, and so this really shows the different um, perspectives that the tool can offer in terms of which indicators paint, which kind of, um, you know, story in, in a given community. Um, with that being said, um, I wanted to just quickly dive into one county and example to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like at a more localized level. So I just figured I'd, I'd start with Bear County kind of down the road from us. Um, again, I went over some of these indicators earlier when we were looking at some of the most populated counties in the state. But as we can see, for the average low to moderate income household, um, they spend roughly 8% of their income on energy costs. Um, Bear County has a 60% EJ screen vulnerability index percentile, largely driven by the number of low income households and the, the relatively high uh, BIPOC population in the region. Um, but I also wanted to focus on some of the more localized figures I have here at the bottom. So again, um, the average energy affordability gap for all low to moderate income households is about you know, $389, $400 a year or so. Um, but if we actually look at those with the absolute lowest incomes, so those between zero and 30% of area median income, that figure can rise up to $1,200 extra, extra per year, meaning beyond their affordability threshold at that income. Um, the tool also can paint different pictures of affordability in different municipalities in a given county. So this particular um, chart here just shows the, the relative change in average energy burden across the most populated cities within Bear County, as well as the average energy affordability gap um, per household in those counties uh, um, for those eight, zero to 80% of AMI. Um, so as you can see, for those in Atascosa, um, sorry, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, they're saddled, and also in Bernie, they're saddled with some of the highest um, energy burdens and energy affordability gaps um, in Bear County. 
And then um, this is the, the part that I think is the most interesting to me personally, is that um, the tool is able to demonstrate energy burden percentage at the census tract level. So this really goes, uh, this is really important, I think, for, for those in local government to really understand at the, you know, at the ground level, at the block level, at the community level, you know, which communities are, are faced with some of the highest energy burdens and then what can we do to investigate what's causing that? So while this data can't answer all those questions for us, it can at least, um, you know, start a conversation and help us to point out, um, you know, start the process of better understanding what's driving these higher energy burdens across the board. So um, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of juxtapose the energy burden map here on the left, which shows... Um, relative energy burden in a given census tract area with the green being the lowest and the red being the highest um, with the racial demographic map of the greater San Antonio area, because you can see some clear overlaps between uh, the highest energy burden communities and those that are, are BIPOC in um, the greater San Antonio area. Um, and then also very interestingly, the tool can sort of paint a picture with respect to um, income and housing stock in a given area. So this is for Bear County as well. Um, and this is a pretty overwhelming chart here, but it can demonstrate um, both for income levels and housing stock type, um, being older and newer, single family, multifamily, manufactured and other homes. What are the energy burden percentages that people face in all these different categories? So as we can see here, just right off the bat, um, for uh, homeowners in the other category making between zero and 30 percent of the area median income they're saddled with the highest energy burden percentages as well as the highest energy affordability gaps and typically the other category encompasses things like um, manufactured homes mobile homes things like that that don't fall into traditional housing categories and and so um, that basically just demonstrates how housing and energy burdens are are you know, completely linked and that um, there's a lot of value in investing in, in homes in order to address some of these energy uh, burden, energy affordability concerns. And just to wrap things up from my end, um, as I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, um, you know, where can I get this information? How can, how can I access this and how can I incorporate it into the work that I do? So um, as I mentioned, kind of in one of the earlier slides, this, this tool is still in beta form. So it's not publicly available yet, but it's something that we're working on. Um, and we're working with our partners at SIA to, to ensure that this can end up in policymakers' hands. But that doesn't mean we can't help you access this information. And uh, we'll dive in this, dive into this a little bit more later. But um, you know, we're here to help. Please reach out to us if any of this information is interesting to you or you think it would benefit the work that you do. And we're more than happy to provide you with all the information that we can on the topic. Um, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bobachi to uh, wrap us up. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, thanks for taking us through um, quickly about the energy equity inspector tool. So I want to just quickly talk about our community voices in energy survey, which um, when combined with the energy equity inspector tool becomes very powerful for providing a bit more insight onto sort of like how um, households that contend with low um, and moderate income sort of deal with energy and how that impacts the energy equity uh, projects that we're working on. So um, this is not the first time that, you know, TEPRI as an organization has sort of worked in a statewide survey. We did something in the past called the Low Income Community Profile Series, but we wanted to continue it because there is an like in this constant um, growing interest and growing importance in understanding how, you know, the millions of households who do contend with low incomes are disproportionately impacted by energy equity, inflation, and other aspects of energy prices that we're seeing in the recent past months. So the main objective of uh, the Community Voices and Energy Survey is really to kind of understand the lived experiences of these households. Um, they are in their relationship with energy? Do they sort of prefer clean energy? Are they more interested in reliability? Are they more interested in affordability? And just trying to use that to sort of build um, more tailored solutions that really have an impact long-term for the communities that we work with. We also want this tool um, or the data as a tool to kind of help our stakeholders and our network of partners to sort of also tailor their energy plans and their other programs and make sure that this really um, includes the perspectives of households and communities that we work with. 
So the survey has been broken sort of into three main areas. One is energy affordability. So we want to know how households sort of are um, burdened by energy prices and sort of how much they spend on energy in relation to their income. We also wanted to understand a little bit of reliability, especially with sort of, you know, climate change, just like ex, um, extreme weather sort of exacerbating the impacts of climate change. Like let's think back into February where we had the ice storm and a few years ago with winter storm Yuri. How is that really impacting the grid and how is the impact on the grid affecting households? And then we also wanted to understand a bit more about where are households sort of like interest when it comes to clean energy and sustainable energy um, and sort of sustainable energy sources that they're getting. And so the research itself is sort of framed within the social um, demographic profiles of households because we really want it to be very people-centered and based on the needs of the households themselves. So we started the survey um, in December of last year and we concluded it in March of this year. Overall, we got over 7,900 responses. So after sort of excluding the ones that were partially um, complete, the ones that were in the wrong region and the other ones that sort of didn't fit our criteria, we were left with about 6,500 um, responses that we've then sort of performed descriptive statistics on, cross tabulations to kind of, you know, reference those three sort of categories of energy affordability, reliability, and sustainability with social demographics, as well as sort of performing geospatial analysis, because we want to see how it fits in the context of like the different regions across Texas, which I'll talk a little bit about on the next slide, as well as performing regression analysis to see sort of what indicators are more correlated or linked with certain trends in the survey. And so kind of speaking a little bit more about the 13 regions, so the survey um, sort of focused on what we call the T the 13 TDHCA sort of delineations across the state. So from that, we're going to be looking more into like the top sort of statewide level, then we're going to be going a little bit more into the regional and then based on sort of like need, we're also going to be looking a bit more in sort of that micro, um, you know, census tract sort of county level, yeah, county level as needed. And we're going to release 13 regional reports and a general statewide report that kind of provides a more comprehensive look at the states as a whole. So I'm gonna quickly you know, talk a little bit about some findings that we thought were really interesting um, as it relates to the three main areas of the survey. So um, one of the main questions we asked was, you know, wanted to find out if households consider their electricity bill to be affordable. And what we did notice that, you know, while majority of households do consider the bill to be affordable, there was still a significant number over 40% that thought their um, electricity bill is not affordable, which is very concerning, especially when you look into the very low and um, the low income income groups. And then I wanted to also find out, is there a difficulty in paying electricity bills? So there were two questions that were sort of fitting in that um, question is one, do you cut back on any household um, goods to afford an electricity bill? And the second one is, do you pay to, do you struggle to pay an electricity bill most months? What we found that is like most respondents agree and strongly agree that they do cut back on household goods to afford an electricity bill, as well as struggle to pay that bill most months. And when looking into sort of what those household goods were, we found out that a lot of trade-offs were made between clothing and entertainment, especially for households that made under $27,000 um, annually. And then when you kind of look a little bit more into sort of like the households that did have minors, so children, um, a lot of those household goods that were cut back on was clothing. And for the households that had a lot of elderly people, um, it was for entertainment. And so now coming back into sort of like, okay, we do understand there is a significant number of people who can't afford to pay the bill and who have difficulty um, sort of paying the bill. We want to know, is there sort of assistance? There is assistance. We want to know how are they sort of accessing this assistance? So what we've noticed is that majority of the households do not receive any financial assistance to help with paying their bill. And so it's like, why is that kind of happening? And we're finding out that it's limited awareness about the energy assistance programs, as well as, you know, the sort of program qualification requirements that we're seeing that sort of um, prevents people or limits people from wanting to participate in energy assistance programs. So now going quickly into energy reliability, um, we wanted to kind of understand with all the weather related outages that we're seeing, especially during like the different seasons of like summer, winter and stuff like that, what is sort of that concern? And most um, households reported that they were somewhat and extremely concerned about this extreme weather um, causing power outages, especially those in single family. 
especially those in single family housing, um, which is very interesting for the work that we do at Tepri because we are trying to focus, you know, on projects that have um, this DER. So I'm trying to see how, you know, with this information, we can make sure that our projects that focus on DERs are tailored more to the needs of the households. And then quickly sort of concluding with clean energy perspectives, I wanted to, you know, show there is sort of like, this is more anecdotal, but there is sort of like this understanding that perhaps the um, households who contend with low incomes are not interested in clean energy. But the survey shows that, you know, actually majority of the respondents agree and strongly agree that they want the electricity companies to use clean sources of energy. So this really kind of calls into the fact that we need to put, um, kind of bring on a lot of these households in part of the strategic planning where we are preparing programs and policies that sort of support, you know, the clean energy transition. And then in terms of willingness to pay for more clean energy, so while we see that there is majority of households who have difficulty paying their bills, it is also interesting that, you know, there is still a significant number of respondents who are willing to pay more for clean sources of energy. So that kind of really drives home the point that despite, you know, high energy burden, households are still interested in participating in the clean energy transition. And so sort of to conclude sort of the presentation we've done so far, um, so, um, Angie was really good at explaining really deeply about the energy equity inspector tool and how, you know, it serves the resource for us as well as our partners. And we feel like, you know, combined with the survey that we're sort of going to be providing um, a lot of the reports in the next few months, this will really be helpful to show more, you know, micro level, statewide level, and sort of like county level information about, you know, the energy burden and energy equity needs of households and community members. So feel free to reach out to us. We are available to sort of make more tailored insights, you know, help out in any way possible to ensure that we're really sharing this data to the right um, decision makers to really inform your energy plans and any programs that you're making to sort of, you know, work in this field. And um, before we sort of go, we wanted to drop a little notice right here. So we have an event next week on June 7th where we're gonna be bringing on, there's gonna be a panel um, discussion with um, members of the Aggregated Distributed Energy Resource um, Tax Force here in Texas. So it includes Jonathan um, Thompson from, um, sorry, JT Thompson from, um, I guess his name. But JT Thompson, we have uh, Drew Higgins, we have our executive director, Michael Weiss, who's going to be speaking on this panel. It's going to be more generated by Doug Lewin. They're going to be talking about, you know, what are the needs of ADR and how can that really be a promising energy innovation for Texas? So it, feel free to register through the link. Um, and we hope to see you on June 7th. And then I have uh, another plug um, for any of you all who are either located in South Texas or connected with organizations down in South Texas. Um, as I mentioned, you know, from my presentation, um, you know, there's a lot of really interesting energy equity indicators down in the region. And we're really looking to expand our personal network down there and expand the work that we do and work to address some of those energy equity uh, challenges um, across the Rio Grande Valley. So um, something we're currently working on now is um, an initiative we're calling the Energy Assistance Resource Network, or EARN, of South Texas. Um, and we're looking to help bridge connections between uh, local community-based organizations, local governments, and any other um, interested nonprofit stakeholders or local stakeholders who are interested in um, understanding what resources are out there to address some of the energy equity concerns, to address energy affordability, and increase access to energy efficiency and renewable energy sources um, down in South Texas. So um, if any of you are interested in participating or learning more about this network, please, please reach out to me. Um, there's my email below. Um, and yeah, and then I think with that, we, we're sort of wrapped up and we're happy to grab any questions that you all might have. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Um, so we had a question in the chat. Is the tool um, able to distinguish between energy burden and the LMI community and residents and uh, single family homes and multifamily? Um, yeah, so I, if I understand the, the, the question correctly, so yes, um, basically it breaks down a, different, a given area by um, housing type and area median income percentage. So uh, I think it's for like the more commonly used chunks to uh, um, determine eligibility for different low income programs or housing programs. So it's 
from my understanding, it's zero to 30%, uh, 30 to 60%, 60 to 80%, and then 80 plus. Um, so, and then within those categories, it can then break down energy burden percentages by single family households, by multifamily households, and then by that other category. So that includes mobile homes and manufactured homes and things like that. Um, so it's really helpful, for instance, if you, I, I mean, just think about the geographic diversity of the state as well. You know, housing type differs a lot depending on where you are, depending on um, the income levels of the communities you're working with. And then also just sort of historical housing practices in the area. Um, and so it kind of helps you to understand um, that clear connection between investments and in, in housing and how that can you know, return um, both for the individual living there in terms of reduce energy burden um, and reduce energy use, but also for the greater energy system across the board. So thinking about, you know, the value of energy efficiency um, in all households, um, but particularly thinking about how um, investing in that benefits low income households some, sometimes the most, but also benefits our energy system in terms of reduced demand on the, on the system. Well said, Andrew. Well said. Um, so there's another question here um, on, uh, on regarding resources. I, uh, there's a person who wants to get the link to the second to last slide when you were talking about um, the Energy Assistance Resource Network. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dropping that. Please shoot me an email. I'd love to to hear um, your perspectives or just hear sort of your interest in it. Where it's something we're currently in the process of, of oh, putting okay. together right now. Um, and um, I have like a website mock-up, but it hasn't been published yet. So, okay. just, um, so stay tuned. Uh, I would just um, go to our website, tepri.org and, and sign up for a newsletter. And that'll include all the information um, from both the publication of our energy equity inspector down the road, um, from the work that Bobuchi is working on um, with the Community Voices and Energy Survey, as well as when um, Earn South Texas kicks off as well, um, and we send a more formalized invitation. But um, just sort of in in the process right now, we're looking to build those networks uh, to start to you know get off to a good start, and then um, we'll have more you know structured convenings and structured information once we, we sort of kick the initiative off in full. And uh, if you guys don't mind, put, drop it in the chat for your event that's happening next week on the 6th. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, well, send We can go it. back to this. So it's uh, bit.ly slash Tepri June 7th. And that'll be here in Austin at the, the LBJ School of Public Affairs um, in the Bass Lecture Hall. And those of you who have attended this webinar, I will be sending a follow-up email with the, the presentation attached. So we'll be able to uh, click on these links. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions for our presenters? Let's see. Um, here's a question and, and you know, a statement as well. Uh, extremely interesting and informative presentation. Are you mainly working in the southern parts of the state? So there's a person, oh. they live in the panhandle. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So um, the answer is no, we're not, we're, we're interested. We know our organization covers the entire state. Um, I think for the initiative I mentioned, it has more of a regional focus, but, you know, we are always looking forward to uh, bridging connections with, with people across the state. And I think and most particularly, we're interested in getting outside of Austin and, and building yeah. uh, connections to ensure that we're more representative of the entire state. So um, definitely would love to get in touch and learn more about the work you do um, and to see how Tepri can, can plug in and be a resource for you also. Please feel free to reach out to either me or Bobachi, and we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you have and um, figure out how we can help. Fantastic. Well, I doesn't look as though we have any other questions. Um, I want to thank both of you, but before we end, I, I, I do like to kind of ask a, a, a question about, you know, just there's this podcast I really enjoy. So I was going to ask if y'all had a, a free kilowatt. So something that's happening in the energy industry that's been impactful to you the past couple of months, uh, if you'd like to share. Why don't you go first? Yeah, I can go first. Um, I think the Inflation Reduction Act has been such a major um, change and influence in the energy industry in the past few months. And I think the fact that a lot of that money is sectioned off for households that contain low incomes um, 
is really showing that's a priority and it should be a priority it's becoming one um and i hope that you know there can be a lot of change especially when it comes to sort of energy assistance and energy efficiency programs is sort of like coming online in the next few months so yeah yeah i think that's that's a great answer and i think uh you know that's definitely something we're we're keeping our finger on the pulse of and and looking forward to but i think from my perspective you know at at the state level um, I'm sure a lot of you all have also been sort of watching what's going on at the state legislature and, and at the Public Utility Commission. And, um, you know, it's been a very exciting year at the legislature. There's been ups, there's been downs, there's, you know, there's been a lot going on. Um, and I think there's still a lot of questions to be answered about the future of our energy system here in Texas. And um, I'm curious about what's going to go on with that. And so I think that's, um, you know, the the event that I'm watching and and yeah. figuring out you know uh how our legislature will continue to address um some of the challenges that we've had and um figure out what the future of energy in the state looks like so i think that's what's uh what's keeping my focus <laughs> yeah there, there's a lot to see what our next opportunities are because there, there's a lot going on in the state of texas um, I learned a lot today, and I, I'm sure that those uh, that attended the webinar did as well. And I want to thank thank you again for taking your time to present. And those of you who attended, this presentation will be put on our YouTube channel, and so you should you should be able to see it uh, in just a, a few days. Uh, thanks again for attending. Thank you, and um, feel free to reach out again to either me or Andrew if you need any more information on the event for next week. Um, I'm Sean as well, and I'll have Sean sort of like mail out the link as well for registration. Fantastic. Thanks again.